Hi, my name is Hannah Freeman and I am the one that produced the sequence that you just viewed called The Escape. And I am here to talk about the nightmare that we refer to as our final project. So in regards to the stereotypical conventions, um, there were a lot of them, especially with the elements of mise-en-scene. For our female actor, which was me, I was in uh, medium wash jeans with a semi-revealing top and a jacket that kind of color co coordinated with that. And then um, ankle boots, which were convenient for running, and I say that sarcastically, for our um, male lead, which was Will, he was our actor and our antagonist. He was in um, dark jeans with a black sweatshirt that he kept hooded most of the time, and black sunglasses, and black shoes. And for uh, hairstyles and makeup that went along with that, for Will, his whole hairstyle was to have the hood on. And um, for me, makeup, it looked fine. It looked like I was getting ready to go off to like meet somebody in the woods, go off to a party, that kind of aesthetic. Um, but after I got kidnapped, that's when I was supposed to look like I got beat up, I was crying, I was like a wreck. So I think we accomplished that pretty well. We, um, for blood, we mix honey and ketchup and water at different variables to kind of get the consistency. It was really sticky and it, and it felt gross. But I guess that's okay, it was worth it. Um, for lighting, we had to shoot during the day. We tried to shoot at night on the first day and we shot for about two hours and we ended up scrapping every single shot that we took. Um, the lighting just wasn't working. We used battery powered flashlights, energy powered flashlights, even the flashlights on our phones. Everything that we tried just didn't cooperate with us um, with the lighting and especially it was kind of, didn't really feel safe out in the woods like at nine o'clock at night when it was dark, the sun was down. I don't know, we just weren't feeling it. So we agreed to shoot during the day. I shot the ones of Will and um, the woods and then the shots that took on the perspective of the driver's seat and Chloe took the shots of me. Um, so yeah, we shot during the day and that took a lot of color correcting, which was no big deal. I mean, we kind of forced the upcoming. Um, for a setting, we, we were obviously in the woods and we were also in a basement slash attic type thing that we found and we actually asked the owners if we could borrow it. Um, that was kind of an awkward situation, an awkward conversation to have, but um, I'm glad we did it and the people were really nice. We're friends with them now. Um, this is also actually the car that we use. This is my car. Um, his name's Josh. He breaks down a lot. He actually broke down in our sequence, so that was actually convenient. For cinematography, I think this was the most, um, the most exciting part for me because it was a lot of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So I think most importantly, we have an establishing shot, which shows that we are very obviously in the woods, and that's the shot that you see repeated throughout the entirety of the sequence. Um, there is multiple close-ups, and it's primarily of the two figures. So you see the close-ups of Will, and it's to show that he is already dehumanized. He stays composed throughout the entirety of the sequence. His demeanor, his body language, his composure, nothing changes. His facial expressions, they are all consistent and show that he is serious and determined and has something on his mind. Um, the close-ups of me, originally, it's just supposed to look like I'm oblivious and unbothered, don't really know what's going on. Those are the shots where I did like the little hair flip number. Um, I didn't really have a care in the world. That was supposed to be me going off in the woods. Um, so then it switches and transitions to the next close-ups of me. I have blood on my face. I am beat up. I look like pained and desperate and helpless, similar to how I feel doing this CCR right now. Um, there's also a zoom in on my check engine light. Um, that's not photoshopped or edited. That's actually on. Um, the check gauges light came on a few times too. I didn't get shots of that. That was when the car was overheating. My car actually has problems. So that was actually convenient. We actually broke down, like I mentioned before, but this happens to me on a semi-weekly semi basis. So, I mean, it was cool. No, it wasn't, but, um, then there was also a zoom in on my face. And that was when I was laying on the floor. So plot twist, don't have car problems because you will get kidnapped and die. Um, so there was also pans from right to left and pans from up to down. The pan from right to left was when Will was standing still. Um, and I was just kind of like doing like a little like number where I like I went around his face like that. Um, he's a little too good at pulling off the psycho stalker aesthetic for my liking. Kind of freaked me out. That was a good thing, I guess. And the pan from down to up was when he was picking up the weapons and it was a close up of the weapons, like the rope and the knife, and it panned up to him as he was walking out of the frame. Um, there was a point of view shot. So all the point of view shots took place as um, when I was being recorded and it was supposed to look like I was um, 
being recorded by my kidnapper, which is Will. Will didn't shoot those shots. He wasn't even there that day, but Chloe took those. So it was supposed to kind of pull off that whole like videos that you send to parents, like, you know, send us money, you'll get your kid back, that kind of thing. Um, there's tracking shots, a few of them, yes. Um, so we were following the journey of the weapon and that's when you see the close up of Will with the knife as he's walking by. I was doing a little crap walk. I'm really clumsy, so that took a few shots, but that's okay. Um, there's also a tracking shot where I run out of the attic. Originally, we wanted it to be a steady cam, so we hooked up or we taped my phone, which we shot on, to a bicycle and um, had Chloe ride that following me. But we kind of liked the whole um, handheld and it kind of looked more panicked and also kind of helped take on the perspective of Will chasing me, even though he wasn't the one actually behind the camera. We had an additional tracking shot where um, the Jeep was actually following the truck. And that was the day I asked to shoot with Will and I was supposed to, I wanted a shot of Will driving by, but little did I realize Will does not have a license nor does he have a car, but um, I had no problem using um, the rusty green truck that you see in the sequence, but he couldn't drive it. So there were a few shots when we weren't parked that we ended up not including where I put on his hoodie and his sunglasses and I propped up the camera and had him record me driving by. And it was really funny because like, there's no way that you could tell that it was me and not Will and just kind of the contrast between the two figures. I thought it was funny. Um, there's a low angle shot when Will gets out of the car. That's when he's most in his power position because that's the shot that you see before it cuts away to um, the wooded shot again and then back to me being kidnapped. It kind of shows like an ellipsis in time. Um, yeah. For editing, the most important part was the rhythm and the duration of the wooded shot. So um, it rapidly, the shot that I took of the woods and like the leaves rustling, that rapidly picks up and it occurs more and more often. Um, so this, it was repetitive and the goal of this was to build suspense. So the duration of the shot decreased as the rhythm increased. We also had, um, the goal was to maintain continuity editing. So even though we had all these like cutaways, it took a while to make it make sense, but um, continuity editing was definitely something that we strived to reach. And uh, I'm most proud of my match on action cut of Will getting out of the car. That took perfect timing. I even had to like do a little like manipulation there, editing, cutting some times out. But when he was, um, we have a shot of him reaching for the door. You see him first in the, uh, the side mirror, then you see him reaching for the door, then you see him opening the door, and then you see him from a totally different perspective when he's closing the door. Um, I accidentally broke the 180 degree rule on accident. Oops, uh, I fixed it. So uh, originally when you see like the kind of like the panel wheel like this and he's walking with the knife and then all of a sudden you see him like walk across the frame. Um, yeah, he was originally walking the opposite way and I had to flip it horizontally because it kind of like it went from right to left to right and like I had to be consistent. So oops for sound. I don't know why, but I really enjoyed this part. I thought it was kind of fun for me. Um, I spent about an hour mixing um, three or four different film scores, I guess you could say, to come up with a final product that I implemented into the sequence. Um, I try to match it to the editing as much as possible, especially the brief guitar riff, which I thought was really cool, when the Jeep is actually going um, over a few bumps, when we're, there's woods enclosed on both sides. Um, so the separate sounds I recorded, the knife scraping against the freezer lid, Will closing the door, and faint footsteps when I was running away, those were muffled on purpose. I was trying to skirt, skirt, and um, that's when the, kind of like the monotone music started picking up. So I wanted you to be able to focus on the monotone background music rather than my footsteps, but I also wanted to emphasize that I was running away. Um, there's also a skirt of the wheels when I skid to a stop. That's when you kind of see smoke pick up in the back. I thought that was fun, um, kind of hard to do. The most interesting way I did it, when I shot my footsteps running away I had I used I put the microphone at a distance so it did kind of contribute to the whole muffled sound and then when I was shooting on um, the car door slamming I actually tied um, a microphone which was like the microphone on a pair of headphones to the side of the door and I taped it there and I just spent like 20 minutes just closing it just to just make it like just right not too loud but like the mic was right there so I could kind of um, raise the volume or lower it lower it to my advantage for titles, this was without a doubt the most annoying part, I'm not gonna lie. I chose the font Big Caslon Medium because it was bold and legible and it demanded attention. There's no way you could miss it and it's similar to most horror movies. 
Um, some have a chiller aspect where it looks like the letters are almost melting, but that's more for supernatural films. And um, mine was more of a murder mystery slash psycho stalker, so. So we chose A24 as our production company. They are a, um, they're not solely dedicated to horror films, but they do specialize in independent films that have aspects of the horror genre. Um, they're an independent company and we are small scale producers and we're asking to like work on a low budget. So it kind of worked out. Um, they made films similar to ours called like It Comes at Night and The Monster. And I know those are more um, monster supernatural based, but it does kind of fit the whole same elements of um, spooky, scary, mystery, that kind of thing. Um, so everything was kind of based off of death and destruction and that's what ours was based off of. So it worked out. Um, our budget, which um, the two films that I previously mentioned, they were produced at a budget which was just shy of $3 million, and a lot of like the higher scale horror movies can operate at as much as $170 million. So I think we're in the safe zone as far as that, you know. Um, target audience. So our film has the potential to leave an audience on edge and easily relate to a high school demographic. Um, if it were to be shot in theaters, MPAA would require that the viewer be 17 or older because of the blood, um, the violence, the gore, that kind of thing. There's also probably going to be some foul language in there. Obviously not in the sequence, but just knowing how most horror movies go, that would happen at some point. Um, but since we don't plan on distributing in theaters, audiences could easily download it off the internet or watch um, on like the A24 website. Um, how do we plan to pursue the distribution for our film? So we do not plan on it becoming like rapidly popular in the box office like I mentioned like just a second ago. We want to be more low key and work our way from the bottom up. So we want to be published by A24 and promoted at film festivals in an effort to gain attention from entertainment engines like Hulu or Netflix. That would be cool. Um, why we chose A24 over other films. So I researched six entertainment company, which were the um, producers of The Human Centipede. Um, yeah, there was an error in my logic there. That's fine. So it's, um, I'm merely grasping their ideology of like how the primary figures found themselves in like a tragic scenario. They had two female leads that went off into the woods and just knocked on somebody's door and was like, yo, we need help. And then next thing you know, they're kidnapped and that whole like disgusting, couldn't stomach plot thing happened. So um, what happened in the concluding sequence of events, that was a human centipede. I wasn't feeling that. I didn't want to follow that at all. My mind was not there. I also looked into brain damage films. Um, I believe I referred to them as the cancer of distribution companies. They made an effort to be as unnecessarily gory as possible. Um, more supernatural too. It, I wasn't feeling it. Killer spiders doesn't really fit Psycho Stalker. Um, I also looked into terror films, and this was the most appropriate out of the three that I just described and um, just right there, but I'm not confident that they have the ability to give my sequence the attention at once because they're not nearly as popular as 824. How did I become a better filmmaker? Well, first of all, um, I learned the definition of patience. <laughs> that was a tricky one. I also, utilizing vocab words, like understanding them versus being forced to actually um, produce them, and kind of like exemplify them, personify them, make them come to life. Those are two totally different things. I mean, I thought I knew what I was doing until I actually had to do it myself. I can identify it, but doing it, total opposites. Um, but it was part of the fun, like the learning experience and trying to figure out how things work and um, the whole like everything that goes on behind the scenes, that was interesting for me. Um, the most important things I took away and the most valuable tips I learned at the beginning lots of storyboarding um, and figuring out, like I said, how things work. In the middle, nothing ever goes to plan. So Chloe and I had two totally contrasting ideas. We um, were required for an assignment for this class to actually storyboard. Um, I had about three storyboards and she had about three. We agreed on one. I showed it to her. I had to read it multiple times and um, she said that she liked it. She loved it. Wouldn't change anything. So we, um, we went out and started shooting and she was asking me questions like, what are you doing? Why aren't we doing this? And I was like, did you look at the storyboard? And she's like, well, it wasn't like, I, I really, I just skimmed it. So we actually clashed ideas a lot, um, a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> 
Um, for the ending, editing is so time consuming and overwhelming. I cannot tell you how many times I broke down and started crying in public places like Panera Bread. Um, the process itself, whack. I cannot tell you how many times I sat there and revised and revised and revised, especially in the order that the shots went and even more so after I mixed the sound in. Um, I stared at my laptop in desperation until the light kind of burned holes in my eyes, not to be dramatic. But my favorite light bulb moment of the entire project was filmmaking is based around the art of manipulation. Take nothing at face value. I never dreamed that I'd be taping microphones to my door or um, taping cameras to bicycles, that kind of thing. Like I, I really didn't see that coming. I never thought that I'd be putting on a hoodie and pretending to be the lead actor just to improvise last minute because I didn't think something all the way through. Um, so the equipment used, I used an iPhone for filming. We filmed on my phone. I have an iPhone SE, which came out after the five, but before the six, so it's kind of outdated. Um, it actually had pretty good quality for a lot of the shots. There was a couple times when the camera went out of focus without me realizing it. So there's a couple shots I went back and retook. I did that a lot anyway. Um, so for sound, I used a pair of Apple headphones. And I used the mic on the Apple headphones. Um, yeah, for software, those are examples of hardware. For software, I used iMovie and I installed that on my MacBook Air. And what did I learn about technology? Technology sucks. <laughs> all in all, I would love to go back in time and redo this project knowing what I know now, but I know the whole point was to learn from it and kind of gain the experience and figure things out how, as you go along. But um, all aboard the struggle bus, population, me, this was such a pain, well worth it. I cried at the final product and then I did a little editing and revising again. And then I cried because it was done, and a little more editing and revising, and then I cried because it was done for reels, and that's the link that you can find on YouTube.